All right, another thing we need to discuss before we dive into the calculations is that there are different types of data arrangements that can lead us to uh, do different kinds of, of tests. And you have to get the right test for the right kind of data arrangement or else your results are really wrong. Groups in all these situations means groups of observations, not groups of people or groups of objects or groups of cases. Now in the social sciences, it's so common to use groups of observations that are also groups of people that we sometimes forget this. But it's really important to get this straight because there are enough situations where it's not that way that you'll get fooled and you'll be wrong. So the simplest data arrangement um, as far as grouping goes is just one group of people. So you have one group of individuals with these cute little guys here. And each person gives you one raw score. So let's say you give everybody, I don't know, an achievement test for history knowledge or something like that. Each person gives you one raw score. There you go. And so then that group of scores, not the group of people, but the group of scores is your group. And you can calculate a sample mean from that group. And then you can compare that sample mean to a null hypothesis sample mean, etc., and do a, a single sample t-test, for instance. Now if you have two groups, you could have paired data or independent data. Let's start with paired data. We've talked about it before. It's slightly more complicated, but I think you know about it. So that's when you have one group of subjects or cases or participants, whatever you want to call them, but you have two measurements of the same variable per subject, the same variable under certain conditions, but it needs to be the same variable, it needs to have the same scale, the same minimum and maximum possible, uh, the same, you need to be measuring the same type of thing. So in this situation, you end up with two groups of observations, but only one group of, of cases or individuals, or in the social sciences that usually means people. So here's your group of cases or individuals or subjects, and let's say this is, uh, your dependent variable is um, history achievement scores. So maybe these are high school students and you're seeing how much they learned about history. And in, in uh, condition one, you ask them about history and you use, I don't know, the names of all the dead white men. And in condition two, you use uh, a mixture of the names of the dead white men plus a more diverse cast of characters from history. So you give people tests twice. You test them on history once under one condition and again under another condition. Same test, same scores. And so each person gives you two scores. I always think this looks like stag beetles with big long antlers. Anyway, this person has the dead white men test and the more diverse test. And each of those is a score. So each person provides two scores, two raw scores, and one of the raw scores, the raw scores from one condition, make one group, and you get one sample mean. So x bar 1 is the sample mean of, in this crazy example I've got, the history test where only dead white men are mentioned, and sample mean 2 is the history test where um, a diverse cast of historical figures is mentioned. Now, some of you might be thinking that research methods-wise, not so much statistics-wise, but research methods-wise, you can run into a problem in that what if people just get better at the test from time one to time two, right? Then of course mean two will be higher than mean one, and you'll say, oh, diversity is better, yay, look, the sample mean for two is higher than the sample mean for one. Now an astute student like yourself would probably say, maybe they just got better at the test. Like time one was kind of practice for them, and time two was they, they had more skills and knowledge. And so in almost all these cases when we do this, we counterbalance the order if we can. Like this person might get test one and then test two, and this, this person might get test two, and, or test two and then test one. So we try and either randomly or systematically counterbalance the order so that the order effects kind of average each other out and wash away so that order isn't going to affect our differences. Now if we have two groups of participants and we only measure each of them once, so instead of one group and each of them is measured twice, kind of flip that around. Two groups, each of them is measured once. Then we get two groups of observations and two groups of participants. So let's say we randomly divide our sample into two groups of people, and one group of people gets the dead white men history test, and so their scores are group one, and, they get, and, the, and that's the mean of the dead white men test. That's our estimate of dead white men performance or something, history test performance. And then a totally separate group of people, randomly assigned of course, will receive um, the non-dead white men test. And that'll be that mean. So those are the differences. You have one group, which is easy. Actually it can get more complicated, but it's easy for now. 
or you have one group with measured twice on the same or very similar variables, or you have two groups measured once. The two groups measured once is called independent sampling. Independent samples. So, flashed forward, as we've seen before, you've seen this picture before, you've got all these different tests that we can do. We're not going to worry about the z-tests, really. You've got a one-sample t, that's for one group. A paired samples t, that's for paired samples. One group of cases, two groups of observations. So paired samples, dependent samples, repeated measures, there's a million names for that. And then independent samples, that's maybe a little simpler two-group mental setup, where you just have two groups of individuals and two groups of observations. Each observation matches exactly one individual.